I'm going to read a little bit from it, just the introductory part. Um, and I also want to thank someone who is here who wrote a blurb for me, and I was so kind of honored and blown away, and you're going to hear from her soon, uh, Edwidge Dogbukat. And thank you so much. Um, first time writer as myself, you didn't have to do it. <laughs> We've never met in person until today. And she um, read the book, and I was just um, honored to, for you to, to have you on the back of my book. So thank you. It means a lot to me. Try not to cry. Try not to cry. Okay. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Glasses. There you go. I carry something special in my wallet. My cousin, Jeanette Pierre, gave it to me before my first day working for President Barack Obama in the White House. Remember this? He asked as he handed me an old snapshot. The corners creased, the colors washed out. I gasped. I had forgotten the trip our extended family, me and my cousins, had taken to Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1982, just before I turned eight. There, there we were, seated on the base of the railing in front of the south lawn of the White House, with the Truman balcony in the far back background. Jeanette gave me the photo to remind me of the pride my family takes in my success. Of all the people in the Haitian American community, I carry on my shoulders. I kept that photo with me from then on. Every day when I got my got my money out of the wallet for a cup of tea or a bagel at the cafeteria in the Eisenhower Executive Office building in Washington, D.C., I couldn't help but glance at the image of that timid, skinny young girl sandwiched between my much older cousins. Back then, I was so shy that the nuns who taught kindergarten at my Catholic school called my mother in to say they were worried about me. She doesn't play with other children, one said. She just keeps to herself. Over the years, I worked hard to overcome that. You've made us all proud, Chino told me, code for how unlikely it was, inconceivably, really, that anyone from our family could get to the White House. My Haitian American father and mother, a New York City taxi cab driver and a home health care aide didn't closely follow American politics. They were more likely to discuss the, the they were more likely to discuss the, the dictator dynasty of Francois Papa Doc Duvalier and his son Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier, who ruled Haiti from 1957 to 1986, than any American president. Like many immigrants, they came here to find a better life for their children. I was proof that their struggle had been worth it. As a woman of color, a black woman, I've also had my own struggles entering the world of politics, which even now can feel like a boys club. Despite the record number of women who ran and won in the, 19, in the, sorry, in the 2018 US midterm elections, Women occupy less than 23% of the seats in Congress, even though more than half of the population is women. But when I was at the White House, I was usually too busy to think about how I had gone from being that meek schoolgirl with plays to the confident woman in a Chris Taylor pantsuit who worked at Obama's, as Obama's regional political director in the Office of Political Affairs. I was the eyes and the ears of the President of the United States in 12 northeastern states, from Maryland to Maine. The political affairs wing has three offices in a corner in the first floor of the EOB building. The Eisenhower Executive Office Building is a beautiful historic building close to the White House's West Wing. The West Wing is home of the Oval Office where the US President works. The first time I flashed my security clearance badge to, to the sharply dressed Marine standing guard at the double door entrance and, worked into the West, and walked into the West Wing, I remember looking around and thinking, this is so small. It looks so much bigger on TV. As a campaign operative for Senator John Edwards in 2008 and 2008, in 2007 and 2008, I binge watched the NBC 1999 
I'm sorry, the NBC2 2006 TV series starring Martin Sheen as a fictional American president named Hosea Bartlett. Still, it's hard not to be awed. I also felt a constant sense of responsibility because I was a black woman working for the first black American president. When you work at the White House, whether it's for a Democrat or a Republican, you have to put in 12 to 15 hours workday or more. There's a reason why most people don't last a whole four years term. And under President Donald Trump, turnover among his staff has occurred at historically high rate. It's an absolute joy, but it's also a heavy lift. I like to get there between 7 a.m. and 7.30 a.m. to prepare for our first meeting at 9 o'clock. And I rarely left before 9 p.m. I would go home to my furnished basement apartment in a semi-sketchy part of town in Northeast Washington and had taken a pay cut to work at the White House. My place was cold, dark, and dreary, but I knew I didn't need more than a place to crash. A good night's sleep was never a given. There were plenty of times that my boss emailed me at 1, 2 a.m. expecting me to get back to him ASAP, and I did. In those days, I walked around with a BlackBerry phone, the preferred device for politicals, for White House work in one hand, and in the other hand, another BlackBerry issued by the Democratic National Committee, DNC, for political work. Taxpayers did not pay for President Obama to fundraise or other political events, so having different phones for different purposes kept us honest and out of trouble. Because I was so intent on doing things the right way, I even carried a third phone, a personal one, in my pants pocket for calls and emails from my family and friends. This was not a requirement. I just wanted to be extra mindful. The stakes were too high to make a mistake. The pressure was high, but I, but I was proud of my role and wouldn't hide it. When people, when, when, phone, when phone number three rang, which is the personal phone, I would tell the person on the other end that I had just gotten off of Air Force One with the president, or I was just about to take a trip with the vice president on Air Force Two. They would say, Kareem, listen to you. You don't even realize how cool your job is. <laughs> Man, I'm so tired. <laughs> uh, getting involved in politics can be intimidating. If you weren't participating in Debate Club or Young, Young Democrats of America or Model United Nations by the time you finished high school, I know it can feel like you have no chance in politics. That's why I'm writing this book. I am proof that that is not true. I was a late bloomer. You hear stories about folks whose passions and talents were already obvious by the time they were in kindergarten. I am not like that. I wasn't drawn to a, to a career in politics until after graduate school. I'm gonna end there. Thank you so much.